Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the April edition of the DEF CON speaker series. I am Rupika Rana. Um, I am the director of the Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium, uh, where I am joined by my um, colleagues, Kasia Valens at Salem State University, Tanisha Taylor at Texas Southern University, um, Jamila Moore Pugh at Cal State Fullerton, and Sonia Donaldson, formerly of New Jersey City University, as well as Jennifer Musial and Caitlin Wilkinson at um, New Jersey City University as well. Um, Digital Ethnic Futures Consortium is an initiative aimed at bringing together people doing teaching and research at the intersections of digital humanities and ethnic studies. Um, I want to let you know that keep an eye out for our next speaker series uh, event on moving beyond learning management systems with Juan Wu and Leonardo Flores, uh, which will take place on May 22nd at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern, and also uh, to let you know that our virtual annual meeting will be taking place on June 2nd, um, starting at noon, and we uh, hope that you will join us to learn more from our fellows and our mentors who've been um, doing some really exciting and creative uh, in developing teaching and, and projects. Today, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Eduardo Arriaga to the speaker series. I'm long time, uh, I'm a long time admirer of Eduardo's work and um, pleased that he's here and agreed to share it with all of you. Eduardo is a chair and associate professor of language, literature and culture at Clark University. He develops interdisciplinary research at the intersections of fields such as critical race studies, Afro-Latinx and Afro-Latin American studies, digital studies, and digital humanities. He is currently writing a book examining the way Afro-Brazilian and marginal communities through hybrid and communal digital practices challenge algorithmic determinism in search of data and social justice. Uh, Eduardo has received a number of awards and honors, including the Institutional Leadership Award from the University of Indianapolis. He earned a master's in Hispanic American literature from the Caro y Cuervo Institute in Colombia and a doctorate in Hispanic Migration Studies from the University of Western Ontario. And Edward today will be speaking about community engagement, information curation, and storytelling through digital portfolios. So thank you and welcome to DEF CON. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Rupsi. Thank you to DEFCON for the invitation. Um, do, you, do you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, thank you for the invitation. And, and uh, I'm really uh, happy to be here with all of you. Thank you all for, for taking the time to, to attend this, this talk, this uh, uh, sort of hybrid uh, uh, talk workshop in which uh, we're gonna be discussing uh, the, the digital portfolios, but also uh, will be able to sort of play with a tool called Wiklet, yeah. uh, so we can we can create a little portfolio or uh, what they call collection. Hey, buddy, how was cool? So, um, yes. So again, thank you for 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 being here. So let me uh, share my screen. I'm going to be um, using uh, some slides, but also, as I said, we're going to build up time to uh, sort of do hands-on activities. And at the end of the, of the uh, um, session, the idea would be to have uh, something uh, concrete we can share um, uh, or you can share with me, back with me. Yeah. OK, so let me. Pull this out. Uh, this is the um, the title of the presentation. So the the digital portfolios, community engagement, information curation, and storytelling. Um, the overview, uh, as as I was discussing, uh, is basically we're gonna be doing uh, discussing these these topics. Uh, the first one is education as banking system. So I want to. Uh, sort of revisit this this conception and and uh, think critically about education and how we can leverage uh, that through uh, 
digital technology and the use of digital technology from a critical uh, thinking perspective. Uh, and that's where we go into e-portfolios for students center uh, and inclusive pedagogies, then um, uh, discussing the potential benefits and skills that we might have in, in, in implementing digital portfolios uh, in, a, in a creative and student-centered manner in our classes. Um, then discussing a little bit of uh, types of portfolios, uh, uh, going then to e-portfolios for in the ethnic studies classroom, um, and then the, the, the workshop of uh, Wicklet and, uh, and the hands-on activity that hopefully we will have time to do and, and come up with some uh, interesting um, pieces and questions, of course. Um, Okay, so I would like to revisit uh, this idea of education and, uh, as banking system, and, and that has to do, that's like uh, the setting up for, for this conversation in terms of uh, rethinking what education is and how we see education on how education has been presented uh, traditionally and how we have to deal with it, right? Uh, students, of course, face a, a huge, uh, huge amounts of information, and that has to do not only with our uh, moment in which information is, uh, you know, we, we talk about big data, and we talk about, uh, we have the, 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 the age of information and, and, and digital technology, but in, in general, our tradition in, in, the, in the school system is uh, we, we tend to have a lot of information and uh, and the system as it's been uh, developed is uh, a sort of uh, um, transmission system, system of, uh, of information from uh, educator to, uh, to uh, learner, right? So, and, and that's uh, what sets the tone for um, um, theorists and, and scholars uh, and educators has, such as uh, Paulo Freire to talk about education as a banking uh, process, right? Uh, and a banking process in which, uh, and, and the conception of, of education of, as banking process, it's meaningful in, in the sense, not only as metaphor, but also in how it is connected to um, capitalist vision of uh, education, right? And, and neoliberal visions of education. In that, um, in that uh, metaphor that Freire uses, he sees- he sees and he he uh, uh, looks at the professor as as an active subject, right? Who uh, holds the power, but also holds all the the information and all the uh, the knowledge, <clears throat> and therefore um, uh, this this is the 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 subject that is able to uh, deposit uh, information uh, in a in a in a banking way, deposit information, deposit uh, knowledge into passive subjects or passive objects, which are students, right? Students are the ones who need to receive, are receptacles that need to receive knowledge. And therefore, um, we evaluate these uh, students uh, at the end of the semester or in each of the, each of the assessments, uh, if they, they can reproduce the knowledge the professor has uh, uh, passed on to them or not. If they reproduce it uh, in a in, in a you know in a big percentage of following what the professor said, they they get a good grade, right? So uh, that banking system, therefore, uh, it's uh, problematic in the sense that we only teach our students to uh, amass to to sort of uh, uh, collect uh, a lot of large amounts of information without any, even processing them. So they they sort of uh, um, and I'm gonna use this uh, this word they they, vo they vomit it at the end of, of uh, uh, the uh, process, but not necessarily uh, uh, create something meaningful, right? So that banking process, of course, is problematic in in every aspect. Um, and, and portfolios and e-portfolios uh, as tool for, from the banking system, uh, they have been around for, for several decades right now, right? So in, in the, the 1990s, we already have portfolios uh, and, and we already have uh, tools that, that um, uh, could be seen as, wow, innovative, right? This is so innovative and this is gonna be uh, game changing in terms of, uh, of how academia and how 
uh, education works, but uh, having technology doesn't mean that you're gonna be changing the way education is, right? Uh, it, it sort of changes, changes uh, 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 basic things, uh, but not necessarily the entire uh, game. So uh, when, when these portfolios are used as tools for the banking system, we're talking about basically portable collections of papers and artifacts, right? Um, a place to assemble records, so to deposit knowledge. And usually it's not the knowledge student produces, but the knowledge the professor transmits and the student needs to uh, uh, get back to professors, right? So again, these portfolios, the, the portfolio by itself is not the solution to this banking system uh, problem uh, because they can reproduce the system in itself. And actually when, when we ask our students to create portfolios and it's only a place to dump materials, to dump uh, what they have been, their, their assessment from the semester uh, without any kind of responsibility of what they learn or not, any kind of reflection that's only a uh, perpetuation of the system, the, the banking system uh, of, of um, education, right? So in that sense, and, and that's uh, uh, sort of the setup for, for this talk uh, from what I want to depart, which is uh, not necessarily uh, creating or, or using e-portfolios for that banking system, but creating them for a more meaningful and caring system uh, that will, will have to do with curation. And, and we're gonna get into that uh, in in few seconds. Okay, so the, the question would be what to do, right? If we're in that process of uh, uh, the banking system, education, the portfolios as tools, the tools doesn't, the tools do, don't solve the problem by, by themselves, but we as, as uh, um, subjects, uh, autonomous subjects, we need to actually put the work in uh, so we can sort of change or start changing the, 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 the system of education from, from within, right? So uh, that's what we, what I call uh, e-portfolios for student-centered and inclusive pedagogies, which could be seen as completely opposite to that idea of banking system. Of course, we need uh, the, 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 the principle of education is a principle of transmission, right? Transmission of culture and transmission of knowledge, but uh, the, pro the pedagogical process cannot be seen as just uh, the reporting back uh, one on one to uh, you know hundred uh, percent coinciding with the with the um, uh, knowledge that was transmitted uh, at the beginning. So that student center and inclusive pedagogies uh, are for students to start thinking and in in the spirit of uh, Friday, uh, be cri being critical thinkers, right and and and. Uh, um, subjects that are able to claim and, and to take responsibility for what they are learning, right? Okay, so in that case, uh, we need to talk about e-portfolios as curation, and I would like to uh, pause a little bit here. So um, the, the word curation um, is and, and it's it's a uh, it's a conception. It is uh, so uh, pervasive nowadays, right? Everything needs to be curated, uh, but we need to start rethinking that, and and uh, and, and that's uh, I, what I would like to discuss at some point. So e-portfolios uh, could be seen as both objects, right? The technology, which are not again not solving the problem of uh, of what education on how we. Uh, develop our pedagogical model, and but they also they are also uh, processes, right? Uh, so they are they are pedagogies in 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 a sense, right? You can you can uh, actually uh, develop uh, it, embed your your uh, your uh, um, teaching philosophy, and you should embed your teaching philosophy within uh, the creation and implementation of e-portfolios. So the objects by itself uh, don't solve anything and don't produce any uh, response, but you, that that needs to be tied to the process. Uh, what is the process we want the students to follow in developing portfolios, right? It's not only the, the action of, uh, again, collecting materials uh, for the sake of collecting them, but 
what is the what is the meaningful goal behind it? What is the process we're trying to achieve with um, this uh, um, portfolio creation, right? Um, so, um, but it, they are also curation, and that's what I want to delve a little bit uh, uh, more in terms of what curation is. So um, we need to make uh, the difference between curation uh, as seen from the from an individualist uh, uh, perspective versus curation as rebellion. And I'm using the, 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 the conception of rebellion um, uh, from Loria Garcia Peña uh, in terms, in the sense of, of community, right? Uh, in the sense of connection. Um, so we need to make the difference between curation from individualism and curation from uh, rebellion or a community. community. So um, rebellion, uh, curation in terms of uh, individualism, it's very close to that banking system, right? And, and it's connected to what we are told to do or what we are uh, taught to do in terms of uh, um, what we do with our our um, social networks, let's let's say Instagram, right? Everyone needs to curate their presence in Instagram, and they are curating their, their presence in a in an individualistic way, right? Um, making all the decisions based on what they want to present themselves uh, out to um, to the world, right? To a world of friends that. Uh, you no necessarily see, but they are apparently there, right? Connected to you. Um, but we're always in a in a in an in a in an individual world in which we're so connected to apparently other selves that are looking at our image as well. Um, and they they also the, the other element is they uh, in this in this curation as individualism. They, there is this possibility of creating curating uh, or creating an image that, that is not only real, that is not always real, right? It's uh, sometimes the, the, the product of, uh, of this uh, uh, creation of images, uh, images that uh, there are, uh, you know, um, could, be, could be touched by uh, the different edit modes that uh, um, Instagram brings or any other of these applications bring. And, uh, and we present something that, uh, you know, you, you see the person and then you see the, the picture and there is no correlation between one and the other, right? Um, but also this is uh, uh, tied to a colonial conception of data collection and organi organization, right? Center around just one one individual conception that doesn't uh, respect the uh, rules of the of the connection of the rules of the uh, community and therefore impose narratives on 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 those communities right um in in the sense that uh, i can create a narrative about certain persons or certain communities and no necessarily uh uh, understand what is at the at the heart of the community, at the core of this community, or at the core of this person as a person beyond the image, right? So that's those are some sort of uh, uh, ideas or or elements that could be connected to the curation as uh, an, an individualism, right? Whereas the curation as rebellion, again, uh, going back to uh, Loria Garcia Peña, the idea is. Uh, curating as, as caring, right? Caring for, uh, for objects, but are also caring for subjects. Um, so uh, theories such as uh, Terry, uh, Terry Smith in thinking contemporary curating and uh, Paul O'Neill uh, that uh, talk about the culture of curating and the curating of culture, they also use that idea of, of uh, uh, the, 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 the word curation, which comes from the land uh, that refers to care, right? Care for uh, something. Uh, and and uh, since uh, I, I work in, in, in the, in the, um, in, at the intersection of languages like Spanish, uh, Portuguese, uh, 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 English, and, and, uh, and I used to sort of uh, cross the boundaries the curation, when you use the curation in, 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 in Spanish, it has to do with 
uh, the, with health, right? With uh, uh, providing health and providing care for, for people, for, for communities. So I'm using the idea of cur curation in the sense of uh, uh, care for others, right? Care for, uh, in, in, a in a communal sense, right? In the individualist uh, uh, sense of curation, uh, again, you go to your social media and you're connected to other people, right? But you ne don't necessarily, being connected doesn't mean being in community, right? Be being in a community means being connected and care for your community, for those people who are around you and those values and images, right? Um, so in that sense, uh, that's the idea of curation as rebellion, the, the, the possibility of yeah, connect, connecting and, and curating things, objects, images, but also uh, caring for these objects in connection with communities that are uh, caring for each other, right? So it's it's a process of co-creation, a process of uh, uh, co-development between uh, subjects of, of uh, be, between the individuals of these communities there are, of course, individuals. They have their own uh, worlds and personalities and autonomies, but also they they are part of um, uh, a, a, a community that you know gives them uh, purpose and and gives them uh, um, some sort of identity as well. And uh, the other idea uh, related to uh, curation as rebellion um, is the possibility of uh, recovering erased pasts and histories as well, right? So how we actually, through the curation of, of uh, uh, and that's what we sometimes do at, in the humanities, particularly in the critical, in the in the um, digital ethnic studies, critical digital humanities, which is um, recovering pasts, right? Uh, recovering uh, erased uh, histories. And, and, and trying to reimagine what was uh, some sort of uh, displaced to the margins, right? So that, that, that would be the idea of curation and that would be the idea of how we can use e-portfolios in, in, in a, in a, in a, in a student-centered uh, kind of pedagogy, more, more centered around community engagement and more, more centered around the autonomies of students as opposed to students as passive objects uh, or receptacles that receive knowledge. Um, okay, so um, with that in mind, uh, I would like to go into uh, the idea of, of skills. So what, what skills and potential benefits we would have by using e-portfolios, again, not only as a tool per se, but e-portfolios connect to the, this idea of curation as community engage practice, right? Um, so uh, basically what we have is uh, uh, we are able to create this uh, idea of uh, motivating students for, for you know, mo motivating and engaging students in learning uh, what, what is uh, at hand, right? Uh, and it is not the learning because you have to learn, but it's the learning because there is a motiva motivation behind it, a, a connection, a personal connection with that process of learning, right? Um, but also is is uh, another element which is quite important is the development and promotion of deep reflective practices, right? Uh, and these deep reflective practices have to do with at least two things. Thinking about thinking, right? Which is how 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 do I how do I think? How do I learn, right? And and what are the the processes that I use to learn better? Uh, but also uh, the other part is, and particularly for uh, e-portfolios, is thinking how how do you use technology and how technology uh, helps to develop my thinking as well, right? Or how my thinking helps to develop other ways in which I can use technology. So this uh, uh, two-way process in which uh, the reflective practice is not not only um, not only like a, like a little reflection that you make uh, at the end uh, of your of your uh, class or your course, but a, but a 
process that is constant and you're sort of uh, going back and forth with what you are doing in class and through your portfolio as well. Um, the other part is developing of uh, developing uh, planning skills. These planning skills are key elements for um, the, the, the construction, the building of knowledge as well, but also the building of this autonomy, right? Because uh, you, you're given as a student, students are given um, different uh, uh, pieces of information. And as a student, you need to plan how do you, how you are gonna uh, use those pieces of information in building your own knowledge. So uh, creating these e-portfolios are a good opportunity for students to start thinking, okay, how are you gonna, how, how am I going to approach uh, the, the portfolio in itself, the, the technology, but also the, the creation of a narrative of my, my uh, journey as a, as a learner. And um, the, the, the fourth point that I can think of in terms of, uh, of uh, benefits of, and skills is uh, the possibility of uh, critical en en engagement and development of transmedia narratives uh, in, in connection with communities, right? Community engagement. Uh, and, and that has to do with a critical thinking um, skill as well, right? Which is not only uh, centered around how we uh, set uh, a, a critical mind towards uh, um, um, text or uh, materials, but also how those materials are actually connect to, um, uh, to real communities, but also connect back to me as reader or as a learner of that material, right? So it's sort of like full circle. If we if we use the e-portfolios in that sense of um, student-centered student pedagogies, that's full circle. It's not only the idea of dumping again materials into a technology that you know could or, uh, organize and curate ma uh, those materials for us. Okay, so um, again, uh, these are like, theoretical and, and ideal skills. Uh, sometimes you don't reach all of them. Sometimes you only have, uh, you, you have all of them as goals, but you the, the, the process uh, doesn't necessarily allow you to tackle all of them at once, right? But the idea would be to have them as uh, overarching goals that you can actually have like, okay, those are my north and I want my students and I want my, pro my projects to go towards that, uh, those goals. Okay, so now let's, let, let's dive into types of portfolios. Um, so in, in, in terms of types of portfolios, there are many, several portfolios, but I, I uh, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, I um, sort of uh, worked with uh, four types, uh, uh, presenting first these two types and then two, two additional types. So the showcase portfolios, um, these uh, portfolios are, ba are basically used to showcase students' achievements, right? So, uh, and, and those are portfolios you use for the end of your semester and you want uh, your students to only showcase what they achieved, not necessarily a process, but just uh, collect final uh, products, right? Um, the, the other type is learning portfolios, uh, which are used basically connected or tied to uh, the student learning outcomes uh, and how uh, those goals are achieved by uh, the development of, of certain um, assessments or, or certain assessments or activities within the, within the classroom. So these are two interesting types of portfolios. Um, I would say that in, in, between these two uh, types, the, my preferred would be the learning portfolios in terms of you can see like the process of, uh, of students and how the products connect back to what you're asking your students to or, or what you're proposing your students to achieve through uh, their class. Um, and the two additional types of portfolios are assessment portfolios which are basically designed to test knowledge, right? In a, in a sort of, uh, uh, it could be in a banking system <laughs> uh, process of, of, uh, of assessing knowledge. Did you, did you get uh, the knowledge that you were supposed to got, right? Yes or not? 
but it could be also developed more in, in the sense of this is a process in which you you tell me what uh, what uh, what did you achieve and you assess sort of you reflect back and you assess uh, on to what you achieve. Um, the other one is the process portfolios. Um, and these uh, uh, are focused on, on critical reflection. And uh, these, I, I would say these are the ones that I tend to use the most in, in my classroom, but also uh, in, in other uh, activities as well. And it's, it's uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, reflecting a, lo a, a lot in, in terms of what you were doing. Again, you were uh, connecting with technology. What does technology allow you to do? And, and uh, what, it, what difference you see in, in using this technology from the other, but also you're, you're uh, working with um, uh, an assessment that you had in your class and, 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 and you, uh, as a student, you get to reflect, okay, what was good? What was difficult? What did I learn from this activity or what didn't I learn or how I hated right, the, the activity, but it's not only, again, uh, not reflection and, and not uh, assessment in terms of uh, Amazon or Yelp uh, kind of uh, um, comment in which I hate this place, right, but why did you actually feel that way and what elements, reflective elements you can have in terms of, co of uh, constructive feedback for uh, your own process, learning process, okay? So these are, uh, four of the most important um, kind of, uh, of uh, um, e-portfolios. Um, I've been using several of them, but again, I prefer uh, the process portfolio and, and, and the uh, learning portfolios as well. Um, so uh, Let's jump into uh, the other element, which is uh, e-portfolios in uh, the ethnic studies classroom, which is sort of what bring us together, uh, you know, um, as, as a community as well, right? So uh, the, the digital component, but also the digital component in the ethnic uh, uh, pedagogy, in the ethnic classroom, et in, in, the, in the research uh, around ethnic uh, um, topics, uh, um, ethnic studies, so on and so forth. So uh, e-portfolios in the ethnic studies classroom, but also in the community engaged research. Um, so uh, I would like to start by uh, going into the classroom first, right? So uh, the ideal ethnic studies classroom should be, or it could be, or we think should be a space uh, where we actually foster a lot of critical thinking critically and engage diverse communities, right? So that, that would be the ideal of, a, of an ethnic studies classroom in which students are permitted to explore the world, the, the diversity in, in the ethnic diversity of the world and engage uh, that diversity from a critical perspective, right? Uh, so time going back to themselves to uh, question, uh, their assumptions, but also uh, sort of modifying their uh, conception of the world in, in, in ethnic terms, right? Um, also uh, would be the space to carry out deep critical reflection uh, on uh, inequalities, but also imbalances and, and how uh, the roles have been assigned to uh, um, how our societies have been created and how, how different roles have been assigned to different people, different communities, different uh, subjects within the society, right? Um, uh, I know, but also, and sometimes this is, I, I believe this is what we lack in, in ethnic studies and what uh, projects like and, and initiatives like DEF CON actually try to tackle, which is we need to rethink and of course, this this been happening in the last uh, couple of years with uh,
Hey everybody, we've temporarily lost Edward, but I have no doubt that he will be back. So I appreciate your patience. Here he is. I'm and back. We have you back. Okay, sorry about that. Do you hear me? Yep. Okay, good. So uh, where was it? Where I was? Uh, okay, so. Edward, are you there? Okay, good, good. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, so are we back or? Yeah. Yes, maybe if, okay. you, maybe if you turn off your video. Okay, yeah, sure. Let's see if that works. Okay, so again, uh, I was saying that the, the um, ideal ethnic studies classroom would be also a space to interrogate technology as, uh, as, as uh, a space, uh, a structure that perpetuates injustices and imbalances, okay? So, and the other, the, the, the fourth point would be to rethink technology in a communal way, right? So trying to use that in, in the sense that I've been uh, discussing curation as a reparative uh, space, caring space and caring perspective. Um, so that would be the ideal of, uh, of um, the ethnic studies classroom. Sometimes we don't we don't use it that way, but I think we're we're uh, on track, right? We're trying to develop that kind of uh, of uh, uh, process of uh, critical thinking and revision. Um, in that sense, and that's that's what I try to do with my ethnic studies classroom. Uh, I have two examples in which I've been using uh, e-portfolios. Um, and, uh, and one is uh, the Hispanic culture uh, through community, uh, community service learning uh, course, uh, which is uh, a course basically designed uh, to engage students not only in studying um, traditional uh, cultural production of what uh, Hispanic culture means, right, or what has been uh, developed by the, by the so-called Hispanic culture, if we can just create just one, one uh, category and define uh, uh, several millions of people into that category, right? Uh, but it's more the, the idea of reading that production and looking at that production uh, through the grain of uh, engaging uh, actual communities uh, um, through uh, service learning practices. And the other one is uh, is a class called is a course called uh, race and gender in reggaeton where uh, I uh, try to question uh, the what we call um, uh, the, the way reggaeton and, 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 and music production in the Americas have uh, sometimes uh, portrayed blackness and, and, and uh, sort of uh, 
um, these uh, rhythms that came from from blackness, but sort of uh, were were so uh, kind of white watched and and became uh, so white, right? Anyways, um, so I've been using e-portfolios in these two two classes, um, and I would like to share some some uh, some of them with you. Um, what is important when when creating or implementing portfolios, uh, as uh, as important as uh, when we're developing uh, digital humanities projects or projects in which we're going to be using technology. Um, so, what is our primary goal with with uh, with the, the 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 course or with the project? What is the role students uh, will play, uh, and why they need to document? Uh, why it is important for them to document uh, things within the classroom? Uh, what is the best tool and why do we need to use tools and what is what is the best in, in several sense, right? In, in, in the sense of uh, access, in the sense of learning curve, in the sense of uh, possibility of not only access for the student, but also when, when the, when the e-portfolio is finished, access for wider communities. Uh, for instance, the communities they have been engaging in community service learning, communities that can access uh, those portfolios from uh, no so um, uh, privileged uh, um, connections to internet, like mine probably, right? Anyways, um, uh, so what is what is the be best tool to document the journey of learning and community collaboration, right? So those are decisions that need to be uh, made at the beginning of uh, of uh, your your uh, you embarking into the idea of uh, using e-portfolios or using technology within your class and and documenting uh, that use uh, as as part of of the assessment or or part of the uh, learning process. Um, so in terms of tool selection uh, for these classes, uh, I I've been using uh, sometimes i used uh, google uh, drive google google the google suite but that's uh, sometimes uh, uh, um, not necessarily the best in in terms of uh, of uh, how things are portrayed or represented or 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 images how images are are used in in the in the google suite sometimes the lms uh, Canvas or uh, uh, the other LMSs, which are uh, sometimes problematic because they they are proprietary. First, second, uh, sometimes they are not so flexible, right? And therefore, students don't don't get to 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 be become so creative with how to how to present the the, the material. So um, several things that uh, you, you need to take into account or that I had into account when um, when selecting the tool. So easy access, user-friendly, and um, uh, the, the portfolios are portable. So you can take your portfolio with you. And this is important for students who uh, in, in certain classes are creating these portfolios and they want to take the portfolio, use that portfolio as part of their bigger por portfolio uh, for you know the, the skills that they have developing throughout their career uh, and that's that's important uh, component when uh, thinking about portfolios in general okay uh, so in terms of the portfolio use for the for the classroom and for these uh, particular examples um, there are some uh, elements into the structure, right? And and that has to do with some of the elements that we were discussing um, before. So um, in the structure, we have a piece that made you grow, for instance, uh, students need to, to showcase a piece that made, made them grow uh, as, as learners, a piece that, that was difficult for them to develop, what was the difficulty in their reflecting about it, Material for all for the oral presentation, for instance, if they had an oral presentation, they they put the material there. But it's not only putting the material there, just uh, face value, but curating it, right? Caring for the material and understanding why it is why it was important and how it was uh, uh, meaningful to your presentation. Uh, in 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 some of the classes in which there is vocabulary built into 
what is the vocabulary, but also is not only a list of words, but what, how did did they word, uh, did those words uh, 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 create an in, an impact uh, uh, in in your journey, right? Uh, other media that you use to enhance your journey and and reflection. This is I I would say the most important part, right? Reflection of what what did you learn? How did you learn better? So what elements uh, help you to learn? How did digital tools help you achieve your goals? Um, what would you do differently next time if you had to take this class again, or if you had to do uh, same uh, the same portfolio? Let's take a look at the uh, examples here. Um, okay. See. Okay, this is one example used uh, in um, uh, in the Hispanic Studies classroom, and this was an e-portfolio created by these students about this student about uh, 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 their process of uh, doing research about Panama, but also connecting with communities. Uh, within the within the uh, local communities around the university where where I was teaching at the moment, and uh, connecting both uh, uh, elements, right? Uh, so they they got to uh, create this portfolio with different uh, entries, different documents, uh, vocabulary. You can click the vocabulary, and it's gonna take you to directly to what they did with the vocabulary. Also using. Uh, uh, social media elements that they can embed in their um, different uh, reflections, um, images, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, vocabulary, meaningful vocabulary, depending on, on different uh, um, categories or topics, uh, presentation, oral presentation, uh, reflection. And this is one of the most important parts, again. Um, Again, okay, so that's one, one example. Uh, the other one, let me stop there and share the other one. So the other one is this pretty similar to the old one uh, with, a, with a, an overview or an index of content. So each student uh, had the, the, the opportunity to uh, structure their uh, e-portfolio in a, in a way they, they wanted to do, right? Um, and again, they have uh, words. The student didn't go the, the, uh, the, the BC, you know, the, the important work of uh, connecting words to their context and, and their meaningful, uh, um, the, the 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 meaningful context for for them to uh, use them in 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 the portfolio um and uh, images but also gifs and things like that and i'm gonna share another one let me pause there uh this one is related to the reggaeton one. Uh, in which students had to, uh, again, uh, create this portfolio in which they collected uh, um, uh, videos, they collected uh, um, uh, different documents, but also they uh, develop some sort of analysis of uh, uh, how, Different songs were more popular than, than the others, than others, and uh, and use digital tools to to do the analysis. Then they they add the analysis to the portfolio and comment on on the different aspects of uh, their journey. Right. So that's those are a uh, couple of examples of uh, of um, the digital portfolios on. Um, okay digital portfolios on in the classroom, okay? Okay, so now let's go to, uh, 
to the de digital portfolios or e-portfolios into research, engaged research and activism, which is another component and which has to do with uh, <clears throat> the possibility of uh, not only uh, engaging communities but uh, but also having communities interact through uh through digital tools and through um these portfolios as a, as an option okay so one example that i had is uh, that i have is uh, uh, a project that i've been working with a community of uh, colleagues here in the states and other parts of the of the world uh, but also with communities in colombia uh, which is called colombia syllabus uh, the Columbia syllabus is a, is a scholarly um, uh, project that uh, the, the aim is to collect, um, collect, but also connect with communities in Colombia who were protesting in 2021, in, in 2021, uh, protesting against against the government, and they, they these protests uh, were. Also were on the ground, of course, but also there was a lot of uh, uh, social networks and and different uh, digital cultural production coming up from uh, these uh, protests, and there was uh, a, a group of uh, protesters who were the avant-garde uh, protesters on the ground. The avant-garde they were called the the primera línea, which is roughly translated as the avant-garde. Um, the avant-garde uh, of the protest, and they they were using shields and like in in several protests around the world. Now we have this group of uh, uh, citizens who decide to get uh, shields, create shields out of uh, uh, wood or or, or out of crap, uh, you know, different different crap material, and and uh, they use goggles and they use uh, um, uh, different. Uh, um, things to defend and, and to protect the, the protesters, right? So they are the ones who face the, the police when they, the police uh, sort of come to, to put a halt on, on, the pro, on the protests. Those are called the primera, primera líneas. And what we did was sort of create these uh, uh, syllabus, which is, um, I'm gonna show you in, in a bit, is more, more like a syllabus, like a, like a list of materials is is a is a sort of curation of different um, uh, products that the 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 avant-garde group, but also other um, other uh, participants in the protest, whether in the ground in Colombia or around the, the world, uh, protesting through digital media created. So we decided to come up, come together and start connecting these um, these. Um, uh, productions, put these productions together. And the result was basically this. I'm gonna share the product here. This is what we call Colombia syllabus, Primera Linea Academica. So like I said, uh, Colombia syllabus is, is, the, is the name we gave it uh, in, in, uh, in English, but it's also a, a bilingual uh, product which uh, uh, the, the, the title in Spanish is Primera Linea Académica to sort of play homage to this avant-garde uh, faction of uh, people protecting, taking care of um, the, the protesters, right? Uh, uh, so this Primera, this Colombia syllabus, uh, therefore we created this uh, sort of collection of different uh, uh, projects and, and cultural productions Again, digital cultural productions. Um, we have different editors. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have the possibility of uh, accepting contributions still. Um, and the collections that we have, the, the different collections are uh, the politics of protest, uh, history, uh, memory, and, and 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 the history of the protests, uh, environmental issues, um, academic dialogues. And this is really important because at the time of the protest, a lot of uh, uh, universities and university professors and, and, and different professors in the country designed something called uh, roughly translated like uh, like uh, um, like um, the classroom to the streets. So they they decided to take the classroom to the streets and 
sort of educate, uh, but not in the sense of transmitting knowledge, but having the opportunity, giving uh, people the opportunity to discuss the, pro the, the protest in a meaningful manner, um, they, they decided to open the, 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 the classroom and take the classroom back to, to the streets. So we sort of decided to do the same with in a, in a digital way, right? So this is the product of that, uh, that process. Um, uh, and uh, basically what we uh, developed was sort of a, a um, pedagogical tool, but, but knowing the sense of uh, just having the, 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 the list of sources, but a possibility of interacting and connecting with other with members of the community in Colombia, but also abroad. Right. Um, okay, so that's the other uh, example of how to use uh, digital portfolios uh, in in terms of uh, uh, community engagement, but also uh, research and, and action. Right. Um, so again, uh, that's used basically by teachers and activists who uh, develop pedagogical, pedagogical actions, activists, regular citizens, and scholars. And um, it was the possibility of connecting with these communities from afar, right? Um, so we, uh, I, I'm from Colombia and I couldn't uh, be in Colombia at the time of the protest, but uh, I was able to sort of connect with them through uh, this uh, this uh, collection and, and the, pro the the process of creating the collection. Okay, so that's uh, that's that in terms of of uh, the the talk and the presentation in 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 relation to e-portfolios and how to use them uh, in different contexts. And now, if uh, if we have some time, uh, I would like to turn into the the the, the activity, the the workshop as itself. Um, uh, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I think that's great. We did have a, a question. Um, yes. And that, well, we have one question about whether you'll be able to share your slides. Yeah. Um, and then the um, other, yeah. Am I not sharing the slides? Oh, oh no, share no, the slides like after. Yeah. yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know if you have a, like, are they on, are they on PowerPoint or are they Google? They're Google. So I'm, I'm going to be sharing the Google. Perfect. That'd be great. And then the other question came from um, I don't want to mispronounce your name. It's Kiyla. My name is Kiyla. Kiyla, thank you. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask your your question? Sure. And I don't know if this is for later in the conversation, so feel free to redirect. But I'm curious about what taxonomies you use to evaluate the portfolios. I'm mindful that the new taxonomy and FINK give the space to considering metacognition and that's reflection component. So just curious how um, students are graded or evaluated or feedback is provided. Yeah, we we use uh, the, the idea is. is... Uh, you know, evaluate, evaluating metacognition, uh, but also evaluating um, knowledge in the sense uh, uh, that they they can uh, build up on on uh, the information provided, but but also sort of create a sort of a critical lens toward toward that information. We uh, design rubrics and and assign points based on on how they interact with uh, with the technology, but also how they reflect about technology and how they um, use the technology to to present their, uh, to create the, the narrative about their learning process. Um, um, and uh, that's, that's the way we give feedback to students um, in terms of, <clears throat> of course, giving a lot of comments, uh, um, you know, dense comment in, in terms of uh, each of the elements that they, they use and, and implemented in the in the development of their their portfolios. Yeah, I don't know if I am responding to your, your question, you expect. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Yeah, I think I think it would be a good idea as well to have questions in in case because uh, yeah, I've been talking for one hour already, and it would be a good idea to um, to hear from you, of course. I always get a question. I'm curious. Um, do you have a sense of how your students use the portfolio sort of beyond the classroom? Like, are they using them, you know, when they're, you know, looking for jobs or they mostly sort of more of the sort of part of the education or does it go beyond that? Um, that's, that's a really good question that I, that I would need to, uh, you know, follow up on because, uh, most of these portfolios that I've been doing, they don't have more than four years now. So I don't know. I don't know if uh, if my students, the first students that I use the portfolios with, if they they might be using them as uh, you know to include some of the information or skills in into their uh, career portfolios or not. But it, it would be a good idea, and I always encourage them to actually do so. Right. Uh, at least connect, uh, or if if they are creating like a, a different por portfolio, create a line or connect the, the 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 big portfolio to this experience. All right, we have another question um, from Cole, Tina. Yeah, yeah. What other portfolio software do you use? Uh, besides weekly uh, I've been using uh, like I said Google Google Drive Google uh, suite uh, it's a, it's another way to create portfolios um, um, I, I've been using this canvas efolio which is I have my reservations with efolio because it's a little bit too uh, rigid uh, and and um, but these are are the ones that I've been using so far. I'm in. I'm interested in the idea of community curation and rebellion. Do you ask students to co-create e-portfolios? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, that, that that's the idea in 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 um, some of our, of uh, um, my classes. The idea is to for students to co-create their portfolios and. Uh, of course, those portfolios are um, the product of two autonomous individuals who are going to be sort of debating uh, their conception and their perspective about the, the, the classroom, right, and, and their experience throughout the classroom. Um, but also, um, and, and I didn't get to, to showcase those portfolios in which um, we collaborated with a community and the community members, uh, the, the, the community outside from the university, uh, some schools and, 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 uh, and, um, and organizations, they got to co-create some of the portfolios with students as well. So they, they were invited as part of the, of the creative process of the portfolio. Um, and, uh, and that definitely it's uh, what we look for in terms of that curation as rebellion. Um, what made their portfolios rebellious or community focus? Exactly, that's the, I don't know if that, what I just mentioned sort of a, a response to that question, which is basically the possibility of uh, giving communities the voice to, uh, embed their their um, perspective in the portfolio because uh, um, again when when we go and approach uh, communities uh, work with them as uh, community service learning which is this model uh, I usually tell my students the community we're gonna be learning from the community right we're not gonna go in there to impose some um, some uh, knowledge from from our classroom into that community, but we're gonna be learning and, of course, in exchanging knowledge, right? And and I think that's what actually does uh, the, the 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 portfolios or the the collaboration revalue. Many of Marina del Sol says many of my students are highly invested in banking education. 
what strategies do you recommend to help students move away from that mindset and as they create um, it's a structural problem right uh, it's not it's not a problem from one class it's a problem that if we see uh, uh, education in the US and, and in many other parts of the world, it's, it's the way education has been uh, designed, right? Um, students uh, sometimes expect, or and I, you know, come to, come to class expecting, okay, I'm here just to hear you and absorb. And I, I was discussing with a student <laughs> the other day, because this student didn't participate in class at all. And he said, no, this is a lecture and I'm here to absorb uh, knowledge, right? To absorb. Uh, and I don't, I don't see the point of participating. Uh, I think the, 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 the beginning of, of uh, changing that pattern is creating those discussions with students since, since the get-go of, uh, of a class, right? Uh, why uh, we have, of course, for, for institutional um, um uh, institutional um sort of requirements we have these kind of uh, classes right uh, the the nomination of lecture my class is a lecture right uh, but what does it mean lecture only means that i'm gonna be uh, st uh um, you know standing here for one hour speaking to you and you get to sit there and if you pay attention you get knowledge and right uh, we can we can get to we can sort of disrupt that idea, even though the, the registers office needs to put those labels on um, the, the, the courses. And I think that would be like the, the first step. So we sort of get engaged in discussing what a lecture means for, for students and what a lecture means for professors who are <clears throat> the ones, <clears throat> I'm sorry, who are the ones who design the class, right? So I think that's that would be the beginning. Bell Hooks talks about this in teaching to transgender, meeting but students at the point of their humanity and co-creating the knowledge in the space. Yeah, exactly. So that's I think that's the idea, right? So the, the only way, again, going back to my student uh, who who came to me complaining because I am giving, uh, you know, giving him a hard time asking to participate and to converse in a lecture class. Uh, if we don't meet our students, you know, halfway in terms of, hey, let's discuss what the, the basic conceptions of uh, knowledge uh, dissemination are for, for, for us professors and for students, I think that's that's uh, education, and that's uh, the university uh, uh, here here for, right? It's not for us just to uh, accommodate to the label lecture, and you need to do you need to give lectures, and that's it. No, I think we need to uh, have them uh, thinking about it. Why it is important to co-create or to uh, interact within the lecture, within the, the the structure that we call lecture, and lecture could be like 15 minutes of a class, right? But the rest could be another kind of design. Mm -hmm. um, do you encourage students to link their portfolios to their CV resume? Yes, that, that's uh, part of uh, um, the, what we call prof professionalization, right? In, in our classes, but also in terms of, uh, of uh, translating uh, those big words that are uh, skills, right? Big words that I am able to, right? With the concrete example of of, uh, of portfolios. So they definitely have, I, I always encourage them to do so. I don't know, again, going back to Rupsi's question, I don't know how many of them actually are doing that because that's, uh, uh, that would be in their best interest, right? I, just, I have an observation, which is just, I mean, I, I totally, um, Mar Marina's point resonates with me so much um, in your response to Ed, because um, students really do come with these certain expectations. And it seems, you know, for many of us who are faculty of color, 
you know, there's sort of also something too about like, they're also coming sometimes with a, you know, with, with bias about like our, our ability to be people who have knowledge in the first place. And then to be the people who are saying like, actually, like I want to decenter myself and I want to like center your knowledge. It's, you know, it's, um, I think your, your idea about like having to talk to them about it and reframing knowledge and like sort of, you know, is a way to, to try and, and mitigate some of that um, because, you know, but I think it helps like um, uh, we have a comment about bell hooks, right? Like, you know, to be able to also draw on and, you know, point to other um, voices, other scholars who to ground the method, you know, for the students. So to help kind of try and mitigate some of that, those concerns around like whether or not they really think that we are, you know, people who hold knowledge in the first place. <laughs> yeah, no, but you know, the, um, so technology, education, and so many other fields are fields of, uh, of, uh, of, um, you know, and are contested fields, right? So we're, we're, our fields of a struggle, right? We're struggling to, uh, to, understand and to sort of uh, come to terms of as to what knowledge is, right? What counts as knowledge? Who holds knowledge? Who is able to transmit knowledge? Who uh, is uh, well positioned to be, uh, to, to create reliable or, or transmit reliable knowledge, right? And uh, particularly at this point in time in which we can have a lot of information going around, right? And we need to be careful with uh, what we sort of uh, consider legi le legitimate knowledge, right? Um, and information. But I think that's, that's the role we have as, as uh, educators in higher education, right? And, and in any, any other levels of education, but as higher education educators, we need, we need to come to terms to discuss these basic uh, um, concepts which are sometimes uh, taken for granted, right? Uh, we know what a lecture is. We know what a seminar is. I, I don't want to be part of a seminar because I have to speak. I don't want, I want to be part of a lecture because uh, in a lecture I get to sit tight and right, do nothing if I don't want to, right? But if, if we want to sort of disrupt that sort of uh, uh, state of things, we need to, again, going back to come to terms and, and say, hey, what, what, how we can use this technology, which is the lecture to create an, another way of thinking, right? Um, how we can actually use this technology, which is uh, developed for uh, a, a purpose in order to sort of defeat that uh, uh, structure that marginalized people and marginalized knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, yeah. You have another question? Yes. How would you define community? Yeah. For, for example, would, you, would a student belonging to an ethnic group be part of, a, of that community or should it include individuals outside the university? So the, the way I'm defining community is, uh, again, there is connection, but the connection is centered around caring, right? So you need to care for uh, uh, the other members of the, the other individuals so you can have that as a community, right? Uh, sometimes we think, okay, I'm part of a community because I live in a, in a neighborhood, but you never go to the, you know, you, you not even know your neighbors. And that doesn't necessarily make you be part of the community, although you live there, right? You are connected at some, uh, you're somewhat connected. But community, in, in essence, is the possibility of connecting and caring for, right? Uh, actually being able to uh, uh, be on somebody's shoes uh, and, and uh, help this person, these, these members with, uh, with uh, uh, their experiences, right? Going through uh, experiences together. Uh, if, if, if we don't share the same experiences, at least we get to 
care for you and help you when you need, right? Um, so that, that would be community. Um, but also, of course, this, and, and again, this is the, 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 the beauty of intersectionality. Of course, we belong to several communities, right? We belong to this ethnic community. I belong to, to an ethnic community, but at the same time, I'm part of a, of a learning community, right? Which uh, care for each other in terms of, uh, of uh, um, uh, you know, supporting each other, uh, for instance, I'm part of, of, of this great learning community, which is ACH, which care for each other. And, you know, we sort of, we understand that we're humans and we have limitations and we have a lot of fun on our plate. And, but we sort of take responsibility for the other, for, for what we need to do. And so we can, we can uh, help other people and don't let other people down, right? So. That's, that, that would be the idea of community and that makes us uh, um, go in the direction of, of okay, uh, I'm gonna create this e-portfolio for my community outside the university, right? In connection with my community outside the university, but it's part of the community of the university as well. So uh, this student that, that is part of the example is part of both communities, right? If 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 this student is is connected through a process of care, right? I don't know if I respond. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, Marina says in my classes I refer to the members of the class as part of our classroom community. Exactly. And and uh, you know um, uh, sometimes. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if uh, if uh, it is uh, professors, ethnic studies professors or, or language professors, but I think we're sort of uh, um, well equipped to create that sense of community and, and sort of uh, um, change that uh, mindset in students, right? They are, when, when they go into the, the STEM class, into the biology into the chemistry they sit each, they sit in big classrooms and they don't talk to each other uh, right and sometimes they not even know their names in my classroom they need to know their names and they need to talk to each other and you know we sort of um, uh, care for the other person in terms of we're, we're here to to support you right uh, and um, so that, that that would be the the basic idea I don't know this could be and should be implemented in other types of, of classes and, 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 you know, make the university as a place in which we definitely can uh, um, interact beyond the, well, the, the, the creation of knowledge is, is important, but beyond the, the you know, the, the business as usual. Yeah. I have a question. Dita says, I have a question, how methods and practices travel across contexts and cultures? Um, um, I could, hi, I just wanted to maybe just quickly, maybe explain yeah. where I'm coming from on that. Um, thank you for reading. Um, so essentially, and uh, I guess I all, like some of the things in my head, like uh, that I always feel mindful or maybe reserved uh, to engage with, for example, what really resonates about what you talked about in terms of Garcia Pena's like conception of um, called curation and curate, curation as a rebellion in community. And that just makes me think as someone who's a uh, white scholar from the Balkans working in a UK context. And mm -hmm. I've, I work with different kinds of communities and young people in education, but particularly my question is more for a kind of a personal academic project that is somewhat autoethnographic is, you know, something that I, I found and many of my students find draw great um, inspiration, like from black studies and confabulation and how to, in the absence of memory to um, essentially uh, use your imagination uh, when there's no archival material. So personally, I come from an um, ethnic minority in the Balkans and 
there is very little material and I just feel compelled if I was to write a book based on my work with minorities young people in the Balkans who are from a different ethnic minority um, I feel for my position as a scholar uh, I feel the end of so other types of trauma um, it's very central and important for me to find my own voice to honor you know, my heritage in order to be able to then honor like the heritage of other participants. So mm -hmm. I guess, sorry for this like a long winded elaboration, but really this is what, like my question is, on the one hand, you know, there's quite a lot, you know, that especially in an Anglo-Saxon context and contemporary uh, scholarship that informs my thinking about, you know, what to do in the absence of memory. But on the other hand, it makes me think to what extent, you know, that, um, yeah, how to engage with something that is from a completely different context or culture, and but there's lack of um, material for for, mm -hmm. for your specific um, culture. Yeah. Now, th thank you for your question. This is this is a great uh, great topic and great question because I I think uh, and that makes me uh, think of a of a. Um, visual artists that I was uh, uh, working with and studying a um, few years ago, and and she was working on on uh, on black culture, particularly Afro-descendant culture in in the Americas, um, and and she was discussing how uh, black culture and 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 uh, and Afro-descendancy uh, it's a sort of uh, um, you know to use this metaphor of anthropophagus uh, kind of uh, culture that you know eats everything that comes comes around right uh, and 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 uh, that that sort of fits from from different cultural perspectives right so to create uh, their own their own uh, image of culture um and uh, be precisely because uh, they're they're their past, their their tradition has been erased or or invisibilized or things like that, right? Um, and I think, you know, we we tend to do so, and 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 a lot of uh, um, ethnic communities, uh, marginalized ethnic communities, tend to do so, uh, and more so with uh, with technologies, right? With digital technologies, you get to see what other people in other parts of the world are doing and you sort of identify with these communities and sort of ap appropriate in the in, in a positive sense because the appropriation term could be seen as you know negative but the appropriate or use adapt uh, the methodologies and conceptions uh, to sort of uh, understand or or portray your own culture i think um uh those uh, again to to go to your question the methods and 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 uh, and, um, and practices actually are traveling a lot you know around the world and we're sort of up appropriating or adapting them in different ways and uh, and uh, using them in terms of of uh, uh, to to advance our own agendas i i've been again writing this book about uh, afro brazilian communities how they actually use a lot of uh, the discourse around uh, data, you know, big data and 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 uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship, and they adapt that language into their own context, right? To to say, hey, what we have been doing for centuries, these black uh, uh, communities, black women with their small business uh, selling. Uh, uh, coffee or selling uh, y X, Y, and Z on the street is part of uh, um, entrepreneurship, right? And we need to uh, connect that um, and 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 give it like like uh, the the image of what entrepreneurship is called in in the global sense, right? Uh, so sort of adapting, adapting it, or or how um, they they use the the, the idea of of uh, data autonomy. To to claim to reclaim their 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 stewardship towards uh, the owning the data they produce to uh, represent the favela, for instance, right? Uh, as opposed to just uh, this person who is uh, 
uh, knowledgeable of data analytics could represent uh, or or the census or uh, so on and so forth could represent what the favela is without even setting foot on the favela right so i think that that uh, that is happening and it's 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 been happening for a long time and it's happening even more now um so we we tend to adapt what works for other communities to our own communities so we can we can uh, survive, right? We can make the way into the system, let's say. I don't know if that responds to your question. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? I think I'll, I'll be able to uh, share both of the, um, the slides and I, I prepared uh, a set of uh, uh, instructions for the um, for the workshop as well. So I, I, I will be able to share both. Um, and um, yeah, that will give us and, and if you if you create a portfolio and you would like to link it to me so I can have it as part of my portfolio of portfolios, that would be great <laughs> as well. Uh, but yeah. I think the, the the conversation is the most enriching part of of uh, of these presentations, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And if you aren't able to drop the link in the chat now, I can always email yeah. everybody. Um, whatever's easiest for you. Yeah, I'm gonna do that right now. Well, please join me in thanking Edward. Um, this was absolutely enlightening. Um, I loved hearing how you connected the portfolios to, you know, curation, rebellion. It was lovely and beautiful. And thank you so much. No, thank you uh, all for, again, for attending the presentation. It's been uh, uh, wonderful to see uh, all of you um, and and your questions. Again, the discussions are, are the best part of, uh, of the presentations, not to know the, you know, the sitting for an hour listening to a guy. <laughs> <Speaking> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah.